En route to Alaska by way of the Inland Passage, often referred to as the Lover's Lane of the Seven Seas, we learn that we are sailing over the longest protected ocean waterway in the world, and we are inspired by the majestic snow-covered mountains that loom about us on all sides. captain of our ship prefers duty on the upper bridge as this affords him the opportunity of admiring the scenery which he tells us presents a different aspect on each voyage. Perhaps the safest deep sea navigation in the world is in this region where channels are deeper than need be for the largest ships afloat and even the echoes of a ship's whistle are sufficient to guide a good pilot through the thickest fog and the blackest night. And now we are approaching the little town of Seward, ocean terminal of the Alaska Railway and gateway to the interior, beautifully situated on the north end of Resurrection Bay. Seward, a modern little city with about a thousand inhabitants, was named after William H. Seward, who as Secretary of State in President Johnson's cabinet, negotiated for the purchase of Alaska from Russia for $7,200,000. That was in 1867, and it was referred to then as Seward's Folly. Since its purchase, however, the returns to the United States on the original investment have been about 2,430%. So much for Seward's Folly. Most outsiders are inclined to think of Alaska as a land of perpetual ice and snow, with all its ports frozen in during the winter months. But with the possible exception of Nome and northern Alaska, this is not true. And in the summertime, even though the snow remains on the mountaintops, the swift flowing streams are not cold enough to prevent visitors from bathing in them with a fair degree of comfort. These young ladies, by the way, are not native daughters or polar bear bathers. They are passengers from the ship that landed us in Seward. And here is our friend, the captain, a confirmed angler, who takes a sporting advantage of his ship's two-day layover at Seward. Unfortunately, the lusty trout are not biting at the moment, and we wonder if this could be one of the reasons. Among the many animals that thrive in Alaska are silver fox and mink, and a profitable business is being developed by those who domesticate and breed these animals for their valuable furs. Here are two litters of baby minks, only a few days old. The principal characteristic of the mink is its amphibious mode of life. It swims and dives with ease, and makes its nest along the banks of streams, producing five or six young once a year, usually in April. Vying commercially with the mink are the Alaskan silver foxes, which in their baby state are not unlike a litter of puppy dogs. And here's what happens to the baby foxes after they grow up. Twenty-three miles north of Seward on the shores of Lake Kenai, one of Alaska's largest and most beautiful lakes, is an Alaskan roadhouse, a haven for weary travelers. There are hundreds of roadhouses in Alaska, but this one is unusual because of the courageous widow who owns it, Mrs. Nellie Loying, better known as Alaska Nellie. During her 30 years in Alaska, she has cooked, washed, mended, trapped, prospected for gold, driven a dog team mail route, twice acted as postmistress for Uncle Sam, and has been twice sheriff of Kern Creek. Over 15,000 people have written their names on her roadhouse register. 
Among the visitors, there have been two presidents of the United States, many people of foreign nobility, senators and congressmen, and world travelers, including your narrator. The first question that most visitors usually ask of Alaska Nellie is, what was your most thrilling experience? And she invariably answers by showing three crippled fingers that date back to the day a giant brown bear chased her into a barn. According to Nellie's story, while closing the door behind her, the bear clawed at her fingers. Later, Nellie shot the bear, and this skin is all that's left of him. Through long years and at thousands of dollars of expense, Nellie has gathered together one or more specimens of each animal that has its habitat in Alaska. Her collection of animal heads is becoming famous, and with each head goes the story of how the animal was caught. This particular story, however, is interrupted by the tingle of a little bell in Nellie's kitchen. She informs us that this is her fish bell. And now comes Nellie's famous fishing act, which afforded amusement to the late president, Warren G. Harding, during his visit here. Ah, we may be greenhorns from the city, Nellie, but we do know the difference between a live fish and a stuffed one. Anyway, the idea is all right, and we know the live fish aren't biting today so we'll forgive you this time. Nevertheless, Nellie insists that the bell idea has been a great success, and in the right season, she has pulled in through her window as many as 50 fish in a day. Aside from hunting and fishing, Alaska Nellie, with all her outward masculinity, has the heart of a true-born woman, as illustrated by her genuine love for flowers, which she cultivates in her own greenhouses. Although Nellie is in her middle 60s, she can still saw a cord of wood as quickly as the best woodman in Alaska. With much reluctance, Nellie occasionally dons a dress and steps out of her frontier woman characterization. Her best friend, she says, is her dog, and of him she has this to say. The Malamute is the king of the trail. He has struggled through with freight and mail. He eats what you offer, he sleeps in the snow, and he stays on the trail when it's 40 below. Of all the multifarious duties performed by Alaska Nellie, none is more significant than that of raising the flag of her adapted land, a flag that was designed by a Seward schoolboy in 1926. And now, as we say farewell to Alaska Nellie, we join with her in saluting this flag, which is in reality a territorial edition of the Stars and Stripes, flying over that portion of our country which was acquired without dispute or bloodshed, and is fast becoming one of our most valuable possessions. Mm -hmm.